Hey, hey folks, I'm back here today to really show off something that I've really been looking forward to for a long time in the, in the towers, if you will. Um, and that is, of course, the ZX Spectrum Next. Now, I didn't really want to sit down and do another review of the system. You know, I'm sitting here in July 2020 as I'm filming this. It's about five months since the first um, of the of the box retail units, if you will, went out to backers of the Kickstarter. Obviously, I'm five months later because, one, I backed a higher tier model, and two, the global situation. Anyway, so I have the, the top tier accelerated model here, which I backed in 2017, and it's finally here, and it's finally been running. And I really want to just talk about stuff like my first impressions of using the machine, show off some of the things which have come out in the time since the units originally, these retail units made it into backers' hands, and really talk about some of the experiences I've had and some of the little challenges I've run into in using it. So before I really get onto that, I think something that's really worth talking about is just what is the next? I mean, obviously you're looking at it here and it's a computer that resembles the, the 128K Spectrum models, and, but it's a bit more than that. It, and it's hard, as the name suggests, is a next generation Spectrum. You basically have a modern way to play Spectrum games if you, you know, to take advantage of that, but also with some enhanced functionality. I mean, to start with, the central processor is an enhanced version of the classic Z80, and not just in the sense that it adds more instructions for programmers to use, which can make doing certain things a bit more efficient. I haven't really dived into that. I'm, you know, I'm a 6502 guy in background in what assembly knowledge I do have, um, but it's also got variable speed. You start off at the base 3.5 megahertz your original spectrum runs at, but you can clock it up to seven, 14, or even 28 megahertz. Now that is really neat because at those higher speeds, you can write some pretty nice games in Spectrum, in, in, in what's called Next Basic. But of course, you can also run your classic Spectrum games that bit faster. Some of them work pretty nicely, others, not so much. It's actually really impressive that you actually have that, that facility on board. It's pretty neat to be able to check out some of those games running that bit faster. You've also got enhanced graphics. I mean, not only do you have support for the ULA Plus when running classic Spectrum software, which is gives you a, a wider color palette to use for your games, um, you also get a much larger native palette and you have some native native enhanced video modes that give you like 256 colors on screen, you get hardware sprites and you get tile maps and scrolling. So the kind of things that, you know, a machine like the Spectrum's greatest driver would do natively, now the next can do as well. And we'll see some great uses of that already. Um, along with that, there's enhanced audio. Uh, essentially, you have three versions of the classic AY 38910 sound chip that the 128k spectrum models use so that gives you nine voices of audio along with that you've also got some digital channels to natively do digital sound playback which is pretty neat and of course it ships with one mega ram standard and you can expand that to two if you buy the chips and install them which i haven't done yet i'm sourcing them's a bit of a pain so i haven't really done that now some of the other features that are really handy are joystick ports on board it's not like the classic spectrums where you needed to fit a, a, an interface unit to, to get a joystick port. And it's not like the Amstrad spectrums where they have what looks like a traditional Atari joystick port, but it's wired differently. Nope, those are two standard classic Atari 9-pin connectors. You can plug anything like these uh, Remake Competition Pros to them. You can even, one thing that's really neat is that you can actually plug a Mega Drive pad in and you can write games that will support all three buttons of the Mega Drive controllers. That's actually really neat. Um, so as I said, there was there are three tiers of Next, at least in the Kickstarter campaign. I don't know if this tiering is going to follow with any uh, second run of the machine. The base model, then there's the Plus model, which includes a real-time clock and a Wi-Fi module. So the real-time clock, of course, lets you have a battery back clock, and the Wi-Fi module lets you talk online to stuff. The main thing is, I think it's Nextel or Nextel which is a sort of a service that's, that the community's running. And the accelerated model, which I have here, has one further addition, <clears throat> which gives you a Raspberry Pi Zero amount in the case. The original intent was that this was supposed to be for running faster CPU speeds, but the, based on the success of the Kickstarter, they were able to install a larger FPGA um, in the machine, which is what all the hardware is implemented with. And so the, the Pi is used mainly for loading games in TZX format and um, playing some audio stuff and room for future expansion. So it's actually got some really neat features on board. 
And so I guess, well, we'll talk about experiences playing it, and I think the first thing to really do is talk about it in the, the regards of running classic ZX Spectrum games. That is, you know, games that were written for the original 48 or 128K machines. Now, there is a lot of modern conveniences that this provides. Out of the box, you get support for loading games in snapshot formats, you know, your, your .z80 or .sna files, which are just memory snapshots of the game in action. You've also got support for tap files, and if you have the accelerator models like I, like I do, you can load TZX format files as well. And one of the things that's great as well is with the joysticks. So you've got two joystick ports, and normally, depending on the Spectrum models, you might have only had one, like on an add-on card. So these can also be very easily dynamically switched over. You can, ch at the moment, like on, on Power Up, it's set for the left port to be Kempston and the right to be Interface 2's port 1. But you can, when you're running the machine, there's a handy little NMI button on the side, and this will bring up an interface menu that lets you change all that. So say you want to play a game in two players that supports, you know, both ports of the Interface 2, you can go in there, change it, make sure you've got two joysticks connected, and boom, you've got two joysticks like you would on any other machine. Um, and you can flip that around. Of course, that's where you flip it to enable full Mega Drive support if you're running a, a modern game that uses it. A lot of things like that. It, it, it's a very nice interface to be able to adjust that. Also, that NMI menu lets you change the CPU speed. So if you're wanting to play a game that struggles a bit on an original 48K machine, you know, performance-wise, let's say Freescape games or any, any game trying to do th complex 3D, well, you can bump the CPU up to 7 or even 14 megahertz, or even all the way up to 28, and honestly get some some greatly enhanced performance out of it. Some games it works really well on. Uh, Stun Car Racer is an example. That game just seems to be well coded everywhere. It just seems to natively do that, because I had similar experiences with the PC version in my, as I showed in my new XT video. But yeah, you can play Stun Car Racer incredibly smoothly. The Freescape games, most of them tend to benefit as well, and of course, other things like that. One other thing that's really neat is that if you want to load a game from a TAP or a TZNX file, when you select that in the in the, the browser, which is sort of the inter the common interface that you have for navigating the SD card, you actually get a lot of options beforehand. You can go in there and toggle certain things that you want. So for example, say you're playing a game like Starglider. Um, the original tape of Starglider, the, the loading system, it basically refuses to run unless like in the 128K version of Starglider, if you try to play it on a 128 that's not in native 128 mode, it will refuse to boot. Um, I found this a lot when trying to play on my real 128K Spectrum using a DivIDE attached. I, it's the reason I kind of pulled the DivIDE out. Um, so it lets you play those games properly. Like you can go through and say that you want to force it to load as a 128K game or a 48K game, which is handy for like some of the really early games like Jetpack and whatnot where they had routines that kind of crashed. So you could sit down, toggle that, force it into the right mode, and, and pretty much get that gameplay experience. Tap files, of course, are really convenient because you can handle the multi-loading properly. And because it's a, it's a high-level representation of the tape content, it just loads really fast. TZX format does have some ups and downs, and I'll get into a bit of those later. So for playing classic Spectrum games, it really gives you a really convenient way to do it. Like for the most part, you know, the, the Spectrum Next, you know, has native HDMI output and you can just plug that straight up for a TV. You don't need to buy any, you know, you don't need to go and invest in a in a in an upscaler or like a ZX HD box for your original Spectrum. It's it's genuinely plug and play. Now, of course, following on from that, what are things like on the native next side of the spectrum? <laughs> Pardon the pun. Um, so let's, it's got to be said, you know, it is still early days. And whilst there were Spectrum Next development kits out there, the, the bare boards as part of the Kickstarter, and some games have come out, for the most part, really a lot of people now have been waiting for the final machines to really get underway. And so there are a small bunch of games that are out there. You can find them on itch, on itch.io. And there's also the uh, Spectrum Next Games group on Facebook, if you do use Facebook, to let you keep up to date with the stuff that's happening. There's a lot of great releases out there. You know, We've got things that are coming with the, the, the next ZXOS distribution, which you load on the SD card, and that gives you things, enhanced versions of games like Lords of Midnight. I would show footage of it, but I have no idea how to play Lords of Midnight. I've never really sat down with it. 
Um, you get a few other games. There are also a mix of classic 48 and 128K games included on the card as well. But you also get a lot of really cool things. There are a lot of great commercial games. Um, ideally, the, the work by Rusty Pixels has to be mentioned here, particularly the only one that's arrived so far as I'm recording this, which is Baggers in Space, which is utterly amazing. And of course, on the card itself, you get a demo of one of their other games, remake of um, Warhawk, the classic shooter that originally appeared on the C64 and Atari 8-bit. And you also get some, some classic game throwbacks. Um, one of the things I really love is there is an amazing version of Scramble, which was put together by Rusty Pixels. And they also have RAMs. And RAMs is a cool bit of software that is kind of a simplified version of MAME. The arcade game emulator, you basically have arcade games that you can run on your necks. It's one way of doing it. But you also find there's a lot of cool little neat, neat little indie bedroom kind of projects. Some of those, again, are in the distribution. I really had fun with Nexoid, which is an arc, a breakout Arkanoid style game. Um, it plays really well. There's also one of the things that really surprised me is there's a great little Space Invaders clone, which is written in Next Basic. It's for as simple as Space Invaders is, it's a really great piece of software that shows what you can do on this machine with with the, the native basic language. It's actually a really neat like set out, set up, and they give you a whole bunch of nice software to start with. Um, I really don't want to sit down and tour the car, but I will I will hopefully have footage up of some of the various things that you'll find on there. So really, like the community is small and it's growing, and you can see some really nice native software in development for the machine. I'm really excited at that on principle. Um, to sort of build on to well, what more you can do with the next, well, being an FPGA system, and if you follow FPGA gaming, um, retro gaming these days, you'll you know, you'll know of platforms like Mister, you'll know of things like the, the analog um, consoles, and there's talk of cores, and essentially in FPG land, FPGA land, the core is what you load in to make it into the system that you want it to be. So when you power the Spectrum Next up, you have a, it loads the Spectrum Next core, and it becomes a Spectrum Next. But one of the things that that is being worked on is the ability to load other cores. Some of these will eventually be rolled into the firmware and be part of the official system, but there's a whole bunch of cool unofficial ones out there that do various other computers and consoles. Imagine, you could turn your next into its rival, the CPC, or you can, or BBC Micro, or various consoles like a ColecoVision. And of course, there's a bunch of arcade game cores. These are all really nice. It's not as easy to use as it could be, but that's being worked on. Um, but the idea of being able to use the next in these multiple ways and these flexibilities really does make it a machine that's very, very capable and very handy. You know, there's a lot more in the box you can do with it. And when you start exploring it around the place, you get a lot more in there. I'm probably gonna show, I'll show some of that so you can see it in action. Now, so one of the things is, it sounds like it's a wonderful machine, and it absolutely is, but there are a few gotchas which I think some of the other reviews that came out didn't really talk about. And I think that it's worth mentioning as a potential gotcha, as things to be worried about. So the first thing is, so I bought an accelerated model, and even though the acceleration isn't really needed through the Pi, one of the things that excited me was being able to load games from TZX format. I'm always a sucker for like, I actually enjoy watching those games load with their original loading sequences, even though it does mean for 128K versions of games, you're looking at 10 minutes to load. But there are a few caveats. Basically, the TZX loading through the Pi is really good if you just want to play a single part game, whether that's 48 or 128. I've found that plenty of games work with it, even games that I've had problems with through other setups, particularly games using like Firebird's Bleep Load, work nicely here. I can load those games up, I can play them, and it works. Now, the problem is, if you want to play a game that comes on multiple cassettes, um, I tried to sit down and load Battle Command, and I really wanted to try the Spectrum version of it out, and it loads up, and then you have to change tapes, like put, flip the tape over if you're using the physical tape to get the, the missions in. And you can't do that here. Um, for the most part, playing these games just from tap is really going to be enough. Play the tap, 
and it'll all run manage. You can also change what tap is mounted pretty easily from the NMI menu whilst you're running. So that works really nicely. If like me, you do want to use those TZX images, the best thing to do is look at getting an, a, one of those external players, you know, a TZX Duino or the SVI CAS, which hopefully I'll have soon and be able to actually talk about. Um, there are a lot of options out there and you can do that. I mean, again, I think I do fall a lot down the purist trap. And so I like that experience of loading it. You might not want to bother with that and you just want something to load fast. Stick with taps or snapshots and you're all good there. Now the next is around the video options. So the, uh, the original Spectrum, you know, was RF, could be modified for composite. The 128s included uh, RGB video and the later models also kept on to that. Now the next gives you three options. The easiest and less ha the one that offers the least hassle is HDMI. You just plug it in, plug it into your TV. You get 576p for PAL or 480p for NTSC and everything's go. And for the most part, it's 99% there. Unfortunately, that 1% really comes in the form of a couple of things. In order for the next to display properly on modern displays with, with simplified timing without making things overly complicated, it does change the spectrum timings a bit. And this will manifest itself if you're playing a game like uh, Aquaplane. Uh, you can see that the border, the border effect doesn't line up right. And you also see this in a lot of newer games that use um, the technologies like Nirvana or Bifrost. These are new engines that uh, Spectrum game developers can use that they they tr they fill about with the timing, require really precise timing to get more than two colors in an eight by eight attribute block. When you run these in the next in HDMI, the timings will break these games visually. And it, it could be a mixed bag whether you want to deal with it, but it's worth knowing that, yeah, you should be worried about it. Now, the next also has two other connections you can use. VGA to a VGA monitor. If you've got a modern P old PC CRT around, this is probably a really good way to go. Again, VGA gives you a whole bunch of modes with different timings, so hopefully your monitor will pick up something that's closer, that's more accurate to the, to the original spectrums, and so those games will work great. And of course, if you have a, a tally that, that has an RGB SCART connection, you can use RGB as well. And RGB works nicely as well. Um, I'll admit, when I originally got the, when I was setting things up for the next to arrive, I was hoping to be able to use a device like my RetroTing 2X or my FrameMeister and connect it in RGB, knowing that HDMI had some of these limits. And with the FrameMeister, the next works beautifully. You do get the normal frame or so of lag that that offers, but it's synced up correctly and looked great. Unfortunately for me with the RetroTing, um, there was an issue where it wasn't quite displaying right right up the top of the screen. Um, I'll throw some footage on to show that. You could sort of see it curving like it was, you'd see it, it's the kind of thing I'd see on an analog TV through, you know, your UHF antenna when you didn't tune it up right. It was kind of like that. The rest of the picture was fine. It was really only restricted to a very small area at the top of the screen. And I don't know if it's a core thing or, or but it was an incompatibility that was a bit annoying. Um, with some of that as well, you know, when you power up the next, you basically hold down a key. You hold down V to boot in VGA, D to boot in HDMI, or DVI and R to boot RGB, depending on what you've got connected. And it'll run through some test patterns and it'll use that to, you know, determine which mode to use. So even though there is that little gotcha around some of the, the video compatibilities and how it behaves, it does actually, you can mitigate it. Okay. And there's a lot to it. There's a lot to what the next is. I haven't even talked about developing on it. I'm actually really excited to just sit down, go through the manual, because it's a really good manual, which teaches you a lot of programming in basic and a lot of the really cool stuff. Um, you can actually download the manual from the Spectrum Next site and read it yourself and just, and just go through it. Um, which of course really brings me to the last thing I want to talk about, which is the mythical talk of a Kickstarter 2. So this, the Spectrum Next team have worked really hard to get this into the hands of everyone. They've read, if you, I don't know how many of the, the things are public, the updates are public on Kickstarter, but they went through a lot to get it to us. Um, there was a lot of hard work and it took them a lot of, a lot of work to produce something that is quite frankly, a very special piece of kit. So obviously a lot of people learned about it after that campaign had run because that campaign was run three years ago. And so there are plans to do a second run and I hopefully more runs in future. And so one of the things that 
that is about is really keeping an idea. I want to do something to talk about really how cool the next is in leading up so that when that second campaign opens, I can point this video to them. So if you want if you want the case, the case model, it's absolutely worth waiting for that Kickstarter. And really, this is the way to enjoy the next. You've got the keyboard with all the keywords. That lovely industrial design by the late Rick Dickinson, who of course designed the original Spectrum, the cases for the original Spectrum models. And it really feels like it belongs in the family. As I say this, of course, there is quite a, a bit of demand for the next. And at the moment, there are people who backed it and are on selling them, not being out claiming that they can't really use them. And those, quite frankly, are going for stupid money, which I do not think you should pay. Wait for the official Kickstarter, get it from the from the next team at a fair price, and let everything go on from there. Now, that being said, if you don't want to wait for that, if you are impatient and you want to get some next action in now, well, you've got a couple of options. The first option, software emulation. Um... Those are, of course, used for development as well, and it's a little tricky to set up. You know, you've got C-Spec, which runs on Windows PCs, or if, like me, you want you, you are uh, using cross-platform environments, there's ZE Sar UX. I don't know how to pronounce it. That's a that's a cross-platform emulator that runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. There are, of course, uh, other FPGA platforms like the ZX DOS, which is another FPGA multi-system, and that one can actually run the next core with all the memory and all of that. It's not quite as, as polished as this. You're going to have to plug a keyboard up to it and all of that, but it is out there. And of course, the the, the, the most common FPGA platform that people know about, of course, is Mr. And there is work in porting the core over. Then there are some limitations, particularly around memory. Um, And really, that, I think, is about all I want to talk about. This is really, like I said, it's sort of an overview. It's sort of about my experiences, and it's about, you know, what how cool the next is and what are some of the things you can do. I think that, you know, it's not a full-on review and I don't really want it to be like that. I want this to be a little more informative, a little more ad hoc, and hopefully something that's a little more interesting to watch. Hopefully it's piqued your interest. Um, if you are interested, check the next Facebook group or go onto the next website. And I think there's ways to register to be notified when that second campaign is. Um, I know the target for the base machine was what the Spectrum originally cost, £175. This was what, 225 pounds, which at the time worked out to be 400 and something Australian dollars, which for what you're getting, I think is a pretty good deal. I would admit, I'd want to see what happens in the short term with the pie, with, the, with what the pie is used for, um, because probably the plus model in the middle is probably going to be your best bet for value for money. I could be wrong on that, and there could be some really neat things to get used for the pie. But of course, the question is how many people... I think the, the accelerated models were the most popular. So it'd be interesting to see where things go from there. And really, that's it. That is just the overview of what the Next is. It's an amazing piece of hardware. It's a cool system. It's a great way to get into playing Spectrum games if you don't really want to deal with emulation or you don't really want to go for the hassle of trying to get an original Spectrum and dealing with all of that. There's a lot of great stuff on the way. I can't I can't wait to watch how this how the community evolves. Now this is, you know, in people's hands, you know. I'll admit, I think I was towards the back end of the queue of actually getting it because of distance and global considerations. But I'm so done happy it's here. It's been really good fun to just sit down, load up some Spectrum classics and try them out with a nice clear picture and a lot less warts. You know, it's it's a really convenient way to enjoy it. And absolutely, I'm going to pull my original Spectrums out when I want to grab video for game reviews. But for the rest of the time, I will certainly be enjoying them on the next. And it really brings me to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned a bit about it. If you want to learn more about the next, I'll link to some cool other videos that I recommend people watch in the description. You can learn a lot more about the system and how everything works there. If you enjoyed the video, of course, please do leave a thumbs up and maybe tell your friends. It really helps the channel just be visible. Like, my channel isn't favoured by the algorithm, so if you really enjoy it, you know, let's make a nice little community here. Um, if you want to support what I do, you know, help make these videos possible, um, there is a Patreon campaign. It helps me cover expenses for making videos in my time. And finally, but most importantly, thank you all for taking the time out to enjoy another journey beyond 
the scan lines with this extra video.